After the fall of the Han Dynasty, China suffered fragmentation for several centuries. Before the rise of the Sui, many of the small kingdoms of northern China and inner Asia were conflicted as to how the political structure of China should work. Some said the role of the emperor and Confucianism should be maintained, while others were for the Tibetan-influenced Buddhism. In 581 CE, the Sui dynasty took power and re-centralized China's government. Thus began China's hegemony in East Asia and on the global scale, lasting up to 450. In 581, Yang Jian proclaimed himself em Emperor Wen, and the Sui dynasty was founded. In 589, the Sui court defeated the final southern dynasty and the entire nation was unified. They were extremely militarily ambitious, stretching their territory from Vietnam to Korea. They established their capital at Chang'an, honoring the preceding Han dynasty. Their greatest and most memorable achievement was the monumental construction of the Grand Canal. This commercial infrastructure was federally sponsored and connected the major rivers of China, the Yellow River with the Yangtze. The scale of the canal was impressive for the time period. It stretched over 1,100 miles long. This was a huge deal for the Chinese as it greatly facilitated trade. The Grand Canal enhanced the communication between the northern and southern territories. Also affected was the agriculture, which was improved with the irrigation systems the Sui built in the Yangtze River Valley. This proximity to the river provided fertilization for the soil and some military advantage. However, the Yellow River was prone to flooding, which was often the cause for destruction. Further north, the Sui improved upon the Great Wall, which served as protection against the ever-present nomadic forces. Due to the reunification, the economy of the Sui enjoyed stability and, and developed on several fronts. Early on in their rule, the agricultural land increased, promoting further growth yield. Shipbuilding design was also advanced, as was industrial technology. The Sui also instituted a variety of political systems, including the Junqian, which was involved with equal divisions of fields, and the Zhu Chao system, which moderated taxes. These structured political institutions echo the Sui approach to governing, which was firm and unyielding. This overly strict and militaristic technique worked successfully to regain control of the fragmented country. While the Sui was super productive in construction and establishing some political stability, their decline became eminent. They were too quickly spreading themselves out, and the major projects such as the Grand Canal were rapidly drying up their resources and money. A defeat in Korea further weakened the state and opened the door for a new dynasty. The Lee family was a powerful political force at the time, and they jumped on the Sui deterioration. In 618, they adopted the dynastic name Tang. The first Tang emperor was the brilliant Li Ximin. Li Ximin began expanding his power west into Inner Asia. To descendants of the Turkic elites of post-Han northern China, the Tang had an appreciation for the pastoral nomadic culture of Central Asia in addition to traditional Chinese culture. This diversity allowed the Tang to develop a unique and progressive culture, as well as a more advanced political system. Li Ximin looked at the political practices of the Sui and acknowledged how they had become overly centralized and took care to avoid this by dispersing power among local nobles, officials, gen gentry, and religious officers. Tang Daozong was a founder of the Tang Dynasty and set the new tone for his new administration to his uh, chosen officials. In a meeting with his future staff, Daozong emphasizes um, honesty and open communication in contrast to the former Sui Dynasty. He states, During the Xu Dynasty, all officials in the central as well as the local governments adopt an attitude of conformity to the general trend in order to be amiable and agreeable with one another. The result was a disaster, as all of you well know. This is the reason that all I want of you to praise public all steadfastly the principle of right house. The Tang grew into a powerful empire and excelled in a variety of ways, constantly integrating different cultures together. A central aspect of Tang art was the large pottery horses and camels, illustrative of the Silk Road trade that was flourishing at the time. Militaristically, the Tang was able to combine Chinese technology, like the earlier developed crossbow and armored infantrymen, with the exceptional horsemanship and the use of iron stirrups from Inner Asia. This collective approach gained the Tang a formidable army through the early 8th century. 
They also further refined the Grand Canal erected by the Sway and the well-maintained roads and water transport systems like Changgang, the Tang capital for the center of the Tang communication, to small coastal towns of southern China, including Canton. This transportation network was based on the Grand Canal. The recreational culture of the Tang, including sports, art, and music, reflected influences from every part of Asia. Interestingly, in 690, a female emperor came into power named Wu Zhao. Married into the imperial family, Wu Zhao seized control and was able to rule effectively for 15 years. Confucian followers greatly criticized a female being in such a strong position of power, and historical texts cite her as being an evil and cruel dictator. Modern historians dismiss these claims as Confucian propaganda, and there is greater evidence that Wu Zhao only furthered the Tang power until she simply became too old. Religiously, the Tang originally followed inner Asian example in the political application of Buddhism. Since the fall of the Han, Buddhism was prevalent in inner and northern Asia. The sect of Mahayana, also known as Great Vehicle Buddhism, was the most dominant. One of the reasons Wu Zhao was able to rise to power was because she claimed to be a bodhisattva, which in Buddhism is an enlightened being who stays on earth to help others. Mahayana Buddhism was significant because it allowed easy integration of foreign traditions, making it attractive to lower class Tang. Mayana Buddhism encouraged education of language and the diffusion of cultures, as well as commercial trade. The diversity of its followers created a unified Tang Empire, where regional identities were able to still remain strong. Buddhist monasteries, heavily involved in Tang politics, were exempt from taxes and held certain privileges. The Tang now encompassed much of what is now eastern China and a large portion of Inner Asia, extending over a large part of the Silk Road. At the same time as the Tang was expanding, Tibet too was reaching out from southern Asia to the Silk Road. Conflict between Tibetans and Turkic Uyghurs saw the Tang Empire increasingly turmoil ridden. In 751, the Tang army was defeated at the Talas River by the Abbasid Caliphate, which caused the Chinese to recoil. Also the reason the Tang became more cautious was the rise of rebellions, one of the most prominent occurring in 755 under the Tang general An Lushan who led 200,000 soldiers against the Tang government. Lasting eight years, the rebellion led to a more wary and suppressive administration. The previously tolerant Tang Empire was becoming more and more resentful of foreigners, especially Tibetans. The Tibetans, being mostly Buddhist, many Confucians of the Tang Empire began to view all Buddhists as classified with the detested foreigners. They saw many of the Buddhist ideals, which promoted seeking out individual enlightenment as undermining the Confucian principle of holding the family as the model for the state. Influential Confucian political officers spoke out against Buddhists as being of alien origin, without roots in Chinese tradition. They often used the Confucian saying, respect spiritual beings while keeping at a distance from them to back up their claims. Still offended by the reign of the Wu Zhao, the Buddhist female emperor, Confucian elites also attacked Buddhism as encouraging female rulers, a disgrace in their eyes. By the mid-800s, huge amounts of Tang citizens and Tang land were being exempt from taxes by entering Buddhist institutions. In 840, the Tang rulers decided these excessively and unfairly privileged Buddhists need to be tamed. By 845, the government had commissioned the destruction of over 4,600 temples, which returned vast amounts of territory and workers to the Tang tax rolls. The Tang dismantling of Chinese Buddhism dramatically wounded the cultural heritage of China and the future influence of Buddhism on the region. Towards the end of the Tang Dynasty, the empire had become extremely dependent on local military commanders and complex state systems. Due to the campaigns of expansion, in the 17th century, many rebellions resulted. Huang Shao, a displaced member of the gentry, led a devastating uprising in 1879. His rebellion attracted many poor farmers and tenants who could not protect themselves from abusive bosses and domineering landlords. Despite the local warlords' success in getting rid of the rebels, the Tang society did not have peace. Their population of refugees, migrant workers, and homeless people still grew. As groups of inner Asians moved into the north China, northern residents flew to the southern frontiers. Due to their economy, instability, rebellions, misruling military decline, defeat by the Arabs, and northern invaders, the Great Tang Dynasty fell in 1907. Both the Sui and Tang dynasties hold a significant part in China's history. Despite their short-lived empire, the Sui was able to unify China 
after a long period of instability and decentralization. They contributed to the increased volume and variety of trade by building the Grand Canal. The Tang Dynasty is best known for its multicultural aspects, from art to trade to ideologies. Both empires are remembered for their success in reunification, strong military techniques, and growth of trade.